Mark, I've been aware of for well over a decade. He's uh, an instructor at uh, Oklahoma City University. My niece was one of his students. Uh, I'm very delighted to be one of his students. Uh, he's, uh, I don't know, he's always made sense to me. So with that, Good to be with you. So I'm at uh, Oklahoma City University, where I've been now for 23 years. And I was a student at Oklahoma City University as well. So over half of my 52 years have been at, at OCU. And uh, as Wimberley Professor of Social and Ecological Ethics, uh, some of the courses that I teach are uh, environmental ethics and food ethics. So I really enjoyed the last uh, presentation in relation to food waste. And I uh, also teach uh, a number of other applied ethics areas in, in, the, in the applied ethics area, including uh, business ethics and, and medical ethics. But my main area of focus has been environmental ethics. Both my uh, master's thesis was on ecological ethics as well as my doctoral dissertation. Looking a lot at uh, religious perspectives in relation to environmental ethics and uh, potentially religious motivations in relation to doing something about uh, the environment. So that's related to the topic for today, uh, looking at the urgency of now, which is a phrase that comes from Martin Luther King Jr. and applying that urgency of now to the uh, challenge of climate change and figuring out ways to motivate ourselves to some kind of movement in relation to climate change. Now I would say being overly hopeful about climate change is very problematic because if you look at the reality of climate change and what we've already done in terms of what we kind of baked in to the system already, to be overly hopeful I think would lead us to an adequate action but I also think being overly pessimistic is also uh, a very big problem because that leads to an action as well. That leads to apathy, a sense of giving up. There's nothing that we can do. And so one of the things that I found helpful from Martin Luther King Jr. is his perspective uh, of being realistically hopeful, uh, not being op too optimistic, not being too pessimistic, uh, he w was what I would describe as being uh, melioristic. And what meliorism is, is it's an understanding, a belief that things can get better, but it's going to take a lot of very hard work and cooperation and collaboration and even sacrifice for things to get better. And of course, if you look at the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr. and others who are involved in that, they were very, their, their eyes were wide open about the reality of, of racism, the reality of, of poverty, <laughs> the reality of, of the uh, detrimental effects of militarism, especially on uh, persons of color. Their eyes were wide open about that, but they realized that things could get better, but it was gonna take a lot of hard work uh, together. One of the reasons I've been influenced so much by King's thought is that I spent my master's degree time at Emory University in Atlanta, and that is a significant place uh, for Martin Luther King. But then after spending my master's degree time there, I was in Boston, uh, Boston University, for four years uh, for my doctoral work. And I actually studied with one of the mentors of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, whose name was Walter Mulder, who was dean of the Boston University School of Theology when King was a doctoral student there. So I've followed the work of, of King for many, many years and, and learned a lot of, about uh, his understanding of social change. And so I find myself applying a lot of King's understanding of social change uh, in relation to the issue of climate change and what we can do to be effective uh, and motivate each other into action. One of the things that King was keenly aware of is that 
Uh, anytime you're going to have uh, change, it requires uh, tension, uh, and oftentimes that's creative tension, and it's sometimes tension that you, you actually create in order to bring about the kind of change that's necessary. One of his uh, well-known uh, sayings that he uh, is not something that's unique to him, but he said, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. And he was primarily focusing on social justice and racial justice and economic justice. And he talked about the triple evils of racism, uh, poverty, uh, and militarism. But we're gonna be focusing more on the issue of environmental justice. And I think if uh, King had lived a little bit longer, he would have begun to be more explicit in terms of his concerns about the environment as well. And he actually was beginning to touch on that in the last few years of his life by using a metaphor for our world together. He called it the world house. He says, we're all members of one great world house that we have all inherited. And no matter what our racial or religious or cultural background is, uh, we have to find a way to get along. We have to find a way to, to live together in peace. And of course, that uh, metaphor of the, of the house uh, is connected very closely to ecology because the root word of ecology, as we know, and the root word of economics is oikos. Uh, eco comes from oikos. So this, this understanding of our, of our world being uh, like a house, I think, uh, really lends itself well to ecological uh, responsibility and understanding. King understood, like we need to be understanding today, uh, he understood what he called the fierce urgency of now. He, he wrote in the World House essay, which is based on his Nobel Prize speech, uh, but then he reworked it and published it uh, a year before his death in 1967. And he wrote, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now in this unfolding conundrum of life and history. There is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is the time for vigorous and positive action. I think that applies very well to the situation with uh, climate change. Now you probably, I'm guessing everyone here heard uh, last year when the United Nations uh, came out with the uh, report that uh, we only have uh, 12 years to get climate change under control, so to speak, to, to take the kind of vigorous action, the vigorous positive action to, uh, to get climate change under control. And if we don't do that within the next 12 years, uh, it could get out of control and we could find ourselves in a situation of uh, what might, you might call climate chaos. Now, when a lot of people heard that report, I, I, I saw a lot of the reactions, I heard a lot of the reactions. Many of those reactions were only 12 years? There, we only have 12 years left to do something about this? You know, that's, that's over the top. <laughs> that's, that's, that's too extreme. That can't be the case. Uh, when I heard that report, I was like, we still have 12 years. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's kind of amazing that we still have 12 years, if, if, if that's truly the case. And I'm hoping the United Nations report is correct. Because when you think about how long we've known about climate change and how long we've known that human beings are the primary contributors to climate change through our emissions. Uh, we've really known, I think in a widespread way since the, the late 80s when Hansen came and basically blew the whistle before uh, Congress, uh, but many other people knew long before that. So as long as we've known this and we continue to, to emit and see uh, carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gases increase, the fact that we still have 12 years is melioristically hopeful. <laughs> I mean, we still have an opportunity uh, to do something about this, but it is the fierce urgency of now, 
And there is such a thing as too late because now it's only 11 and a half years, uh, and I don't want to be in a situation where my future grandchildren are hearing the UN report that says there is no time left, that we've gone past that point. So if anything can motivate us, uh, I'm hoping it is the fact that we have very little time left to do something about this. All of the individual, yes, please. Yeah, I mean, and, and there are already a number of places that are experiencing this uh, in ways that in this part of the country we haven't quite experienced it yet. But if you're in a town that's being eroded away uh, in Alaska, uh, it's, it's too late. If you're a, a climate refugee from a number of different things that have happened around the world, it's too late. So, uh, yeah, exactly. So it, 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 is, it is too late for many communities and many individuals. And all the individual actions that we can take are truly significant, and we need to be taking those. But we also have to be focusing on uh, systemic change, uh, not, not just individual behavior. Now, the individual behavior changes become much easier within the context of systemic change. So, for example, I, I'm from Oklahoma, live in Oklahoma City, and Oklahoma City and Tulsa are uh, almost always ranked at the very bottom of the sustainability indices that come out uh, fairly often. We're, we're not known as a... Uh, ecologically sustainable state. We're very much focused on the fossil fuel industry, primarily oil and natural gas. Our cities were, for the most part, built in the age of the automobile. So they are sprawling. You know, if you want to see examples of urban and suburban sprawl, I think Oklahoma City would be the place you go uh, to see that. Many years, Oklahoma City has been the largest city uh, in the United States. I don't think we are anymore, but I remember growing up as a kid. I, I used to, that's great. That's awesome. Oklahoma City is the largest city. But in terms of sustainability, that's about the worst thing you can be. Uh, we have no mass transportation. We have massive areas of food deserts. We have all sorts of issues related to the uh, environment. And we use more energy per person than in almost any place in the world. So it's very difficult, even for individuals who are very focused on doing all the right things, uh, on changing their individual behavior within those systems, within that systemic context, to live in such a way where they don't require three or four planets if everybody else on the planet lived the way they do. So we have to focus on uh, systemic transformation and we had to focus on systemic transformation of our economic, political, and cultural systems, and, and, and focusing in a systemic way on justice, uh, greater participation, greater inclusivity, uh, and sustainability, and, and resilience. One uh, thinker who I think has been uh, very clear uh, about this is, is Naomi Klein. She's uh, written the book, This Changes uh, Everything. And she makes the point that the challenge of climate change provides us with the existential threat that motivates us towards this kind of systemic change. And that there can be no lasting uh, move away from the climate of conflict. So this is not just about the environment. It also exacerbates uh, issues of social injustice. It exacerbates uh, conflict and violence uh, in the world, uh, that you cannot move away from this climate of conflict without the creation of climate justice. Every factor that you look at that contributes to war and conflict uh, in the world 
So looking at those triple evils of, of, of that Martin Luther King looked at, of, of, of racism and poverty and militarism, climate change exacerbates all of those negative factors in the world. But Klein maintains that climate change provides us with an opportunity to see that we need to change everything if we are able to survive as a civilization or even as a species. Well, some of us, when we're thinking about climate change, maybe a little bit like the, the frog in that you've probably heard this uh, example given. It's one that I know that Al Gore uh, used on a number of, of occasions. Uh, the, the, the poor frog that is in the pot of slowly warming water and you know basically says this is just fine and it's it's warming slow so slowly that the the frog is not aware that the frog is uh, slowly being uh, boiled uh, and when you're in places like arkansas or oklahoma where the effects have happened more slowly perhaps it's somewhat easy to be like this frog it's, it's not urgent yeah it's a little warmer the growing seasons are a little bit longer than they used to be yeah the rain's coming in you know different cycles than it normally has but overall it hasn't had a significant impact on some of our our lives so there's this sense of just kind of complacency come on in the the water's fine but in alaska in miami now in uh, all you know different part in on these islands that are uh, slowly uh, having to be vacated uh, in areas where there's tremendous drought, tremendous flooding. Uh, if you're in Puerto Rico, the water's not fine. In all these places uh, where it's happening quick, more quickly, perhaps there's, it's easier to jump out of the, of the pot. But for some reason, here, especially in Oklahoma, maybe it's because we've got the oil and gas industry constantly telling us that the water's fine, we tend to be more complacent but we gotta figure a way to get out of the pot. Now, the good news is we know that actually frogs do try to get out of the pot. It's kind of a myth that they don't. <laughs> they, they, actually, they actually do try to get out. And, uh, and also a good thing is, you know, we're not frogs. We hopefully can uh, be aware of what's happening around us uh, even more quickly than the frogs are and take the kind of action we need to get, to get out of the water before it boils us, because if we don't, this is where we're headed. This is where we're already headed. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert. I would not recommend you reading it uh, on a day when you're feeling down or, or, or depressed. But she points out very clearly, and there are a number of other you know, biologists that have looked at this uh, carefully. E.O. Wilson, from uh, Professor Emeritus from Harvard, has looked at this very carefully as well. But we have already entered into the sixth great extinction. Uh, and the only extinction that has been uh, primarily caused by one species. Uh, all of the five uh, other extinction events uh, were not primarily caused by one species. And so we're in a situation now where we're looking at uh, half of the currently existing species uh, being extinct within the next 100 to 200 years. Uh, at the current pace. We're looking at a situation where the extinction rate is well over 100 times the normal background rate, maybe even closer to 1,000 times the normal background rate. And of course, climate change is only exacerbating uh, that extinction. I don't think these are things that I need to really look at too closely with you, uh, kind of preaching to the choir. But uh, I do think it's very important for us to be very clear with people about the facts and figures and the indicators uh, in relation to climate change uh, and make sure that we're teaching the, the science of climate change uh, effectively uh, and widely. And uh, one of the best places that I have found to go to that's very helpful for the students that I work with in environmental ethics is the, the uh, climate.nasa.gov, which is their vital signs site. 
in terms of graphics, in terms of just being very straightforward and very clear about what's happening with every indicator that relates to climate change, I've not found anything uh, more effective uh, than that website. The only other website that I've, I've found that is, is as effective or is close to, close to being as effective would be the NOAA, the National Oceanic uh, and Atmospheric Administration uh, website, uh, although I've found that website to not quite be as compelling in terms of, of how it's presented uh, over the past two years, uh, whereas the NASA site is just as strong uh, as it always has been. So I think that's a very helpful website to, to use when helping your friends and family actually see the indicators because when you see it uh, and you see every single indicator, emissions going up to 410 parts per million, global temperature going up 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit since 1800, you, when you see the satellite pictures of the Arctic ice minimum extent, uh, decreasing 12.8% per decade over the last three decades, and also the volume decreasing. When you see the ice sheets losing 413 gigatons per year, and you see the, the charts that so, show you the sea level going up 3.2 millimeters per year, when you, all those indicators are moving in the, right, the wrong direction, uh, it's very difficult to ignore uh, what's happening. We all know two degrees has been uh, talked about a great deal uh, as being perhaps that point of no return. If we get past the two degree mark uh, Celsius, that uh, will have a situation of feedback mechanisms that create uh, uncontrollable uh, climate change. Uh, and we know that part of that would be the fact that the permafrost in the Arctic Circle area is melting, and there's a tremendous amount of methane, and as was discussed in the last presentation, 20 to 25 times more potent than uh, CO2. Uh, and if that, all that methane that's trapped in that permafrost is released, that's going to create an acceleration of climate change that we will not be able to uh, control. And, and many scientists argue that 1.5 degrees is a, a better marker for us to be uh, focused on. And, and when the United Nations report came out about 2030 as being, uh, you know, the next 12 years as being the amount of time we have, they're looking at what needs to be done to keep us below 1.5 and at the very extreme below 2 degrees uh, Celsius in change. So, if we don't figure out a way, so you know, if you, motivation, if we don't figure out a way to stay below that, uh, we're not going to be able to uh, save human civilization. The planet will probably survive, but human civilization will not. I, I'm not going to test uh, if I can get to the website here, but this is one of those graphics that if you haven't looked at it and haven't shown it to some folks that might have some uh, doubts or skeptical about climate change. This is one of those graphics that I think is extremely helpful. It's kind of the, it's the global temperature spiral. It's kind of the spiral of death, uh, unfortunately. But it, it, it looks at how temperatures have increased uh, since uh, global temperature readings have been taken. Uh, if, I think 18, this is 1850 to 2016, or is it 1880? I can't 1850. That's interesting because most of the really reliable data, I think it's happened since 1884 or so, but, but you start out in the mid-1800s and you're in the inner circle, the cooler temperatures, and you can see in 2016 that last line at the top is almost up to 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, of course, that was that super El Nino year, so that was a a little bit of an outlier, but certainly uh, seeing that actually play out in time is a helpful uh, graphic. If we look at our global and national and community responses uh, to uh, climate change, uh, a few years ago, one might, be, might have been a little bit more hopeful 
uh, than today because we had uh, the Paris Climate Agreement under our belt, and we had the Clean Power Plan here in the United States. Uh, we had uh, other countries throughout the world that were taking climate leadership, and, and in many ways China has stepped up in ways that have, I think, been uh, surprising in, in, a, in a very good way. <laughs> We've had uh, grassroots climate justice movements uh, around the world, uh, and in 2015, it really felt like there was a process of global cooperation and collaboration that was, was taking place. And the last two years, at least in terms of the United States, participation in this kind of collaboration uh, has been um, negative. Uh, part of that is what's happened uh, at the EPA, which is the Environmental Protection Agency, which has not been acting like the Environmental Protection Agency uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, the picture of this person is Myron uh, Ebel, who was the person who led the EPA transition uh, process. I think it's uh, not unfair to say that the EPA is uh, under direct threat at this, at this time. The first EPA director, Scott Pruitt, was the Attorney General of the state of Oklahoma, by the way, and uh, there were times when he would actually take emails that were written to him by oil companies uh, and just take those emails and cut and paste them and, and put them out as the position of the Attorney General's uh, office in Oklahoma. So it's not surprising that he was selected to be the director of the EPA, but he is no longer the director of the EPA. Now you have a coal uh, lobbyist who is the director of the EBA, EPA. Uh, the Clean Power Plan has basically been scrapped. It's not being implemented. And uh, we in the United States were no longer a signatory uh, of the Paris Climate Agreement. And I think we may be one of two or three countries in the world. So the, the threat of inaction in relation to climate change has increased uh, tremendously. The economic processes that we need to be focusing on to have systemic change, we, we need to be thinking carefully about moving away from unregulated capitalism. That doesn't necessarily mean that we throw everything out about capitalism, but we certainly can't have unregulated capitalism. We need to have a more sustainable and regenerative economic system. There could be some uh, capitalistic aspects of that. We need to uh, ask ourselves uh, whether economic growth as the primary indicator for economic health is, is what we need to continue to have because we always look at GDP as you know, being the, the great indicator of whether we, ha we have an economically healthy uh, society, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's ecologically sustainable. Uh, we have to look at issues of income inequality and inequality of opportunity that exacerbate uh, the, the uh, poverty that we have in the world. And then um, we have to look at the relationship between the lack of economic opportunity and conflict. One um, equation that I use in environmental ethics class that I think is helpful is to look at population times consumption equals impact. Because when we look at the population issue, there's always this tendency for us to think, well, it's just a matter of there being too many people. Uh, but it's not just a matter of there being too many people. It's a matter of the, the people who are here consuming uh, too much. And of course, we consume in very unequal ways as well. And it's not just consumption, it's the kind of consumption. Uh, so if you're consuming uh, food that's grown uh, sustainably and it's coming from you know, your local area, that's much different than consuming food from industrial agriculture that comes from 1,500 miles. So the kind of consumption also is important there. And then moving away from this understanding of nature as simply being a commodity and beginning to really focus on nature as our community. So we are, we are persons in human community, but we are also persons in an ecological community. And that, that movement from commodity to community would transform our economic processes if we took that very seriously. In terms of our political process, we need much more participation 
Uh, we need much more engagement. We need much less money involved in politics uh, because that's where the corporate control, uh, especially the corporate control of the fossil fuel industry, is able to uh, really keep a hold of our political processes and, and we don't have uh, equitable representation and access to political power because of all that money uh, in politics. A greater representation and participation for women. You, you've probably heard of the girl effect. I know that in Drawdown this is a point that's, that's made as well. But uh, when uh, women have more participation in economic processes, uh, it becomes a more sustainable uh, society. And also, uh, women t tend to have children later in life when they're uh, heavily involved in the economic processes as well. And then uh, a move from corporate power uh, to community power. And then in cultural processes, we have to find ways to celebrate interdependent community and not only tolerate each other, to not only tolerate differences, whether those be cultural or uh, racial or, or religious differences, but to uh, actively work together, to cooperate together, to, to build uh, bridges with one another, to be involved in service with one another, to tackle these great ecological uh, challenges that we're facing in the world. I have this person's picture here. His name's Ibu Patel. He's the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps. He's probably the most well-known interfaith uh, advocate, especially at colleges and universities. And he, he makes this point that we have to move beyond coexistence, beyond simply tolerating each other, and find ways to work together in interdependent community to solve the challenges that we're facing. Uh, climate change is a threat to peace. And as I was uh, looking at the, uh, the threats to peace that we face in our own nation, uh, I came across this uh, somewhat well-known quote from Ab Abraham Lincoln in 1838. He wrote uh, um, in, in this address that he gave in 1838, shall we expect some transatlantic, transatlantic military giant to step, across, step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the earth, our own accepted in their military chest with a Bonaparte for a commander could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge in a trial of a thousand years. At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free persons, I'll say, we must live through all time or die by suicide. Now, of course, not too long after that was the Civil War, but this, this idea that we are the uh, purveyors of our own uh, end, that we are the creators of our own uh, demise, uh, as opposed to there being some uh, outside threat outside of our, our nation, I think is uh, still uh, applicable uh, today. We're the ones who are creating the, the climate uh, problem, the climate chaos that we will be experiencing. So where do we go? I think we go in the direction of being very uh, intentional about creating communities of resilience uh, and also resistance because uh, this is not going to be an easy process. And there are trillions of reasons why there are very powerful entities that will uh, resist these changes. We, we have trillions of dollars of assets of fossil fuel still in the ground. Uh, and corporations will not profit. The fossil fuel corporations will not profit unless the, that fossil fuel comes out of the ground. And so if we, if we really do only have 12 years to address this, uh, we're, we're not going to see 
fossil fuel companies simply say, okay, we're going to back off of uh, capitalizing on these assets, on these resources. There's just trillions of dollars to be made there. And so it's, it's going to take resistance. It's going to take sacrifice. It's going to take hard work. Uh, and it will not be uh, easy. But I do see hopeful signs, or melioristic signs, I might say. Uh, the tremendous indigenous leadership uh, that's taking place, not only in the United States, but around the world. Persons who uh, are in cultures that have uh, a much more uh, intentional uh, relationship uh, with the earth are taking tremendous leadership. And then, especially in the last six months, even before then, but especially in the last six months, the, the young people, youth around the world, of course, Greta being one of the key global leaders there, but the Sunrise Movement uh, is another uh, movement of young people that's very hopeful. And then I'll just say that the, the Green New Deal, whether you agree with uh, all of the components of the Green New Deal, it is of the scope uh, that we, we need to be thinking about. In, in addressing the, the, the changes that need to be made. So everything in the Green New Deal might not be the exact things to be doing, but we have to be thinking in that broad, systemic way. It's not just about changing individual behavior. It is about changing these economic systems, these political systems, uh, and our relationship uh, with nature. So the Green New Deal, I think, is very helpful at this point because it, 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 it does have that sense of scope, that sense of urgency, and that sense of understanding that this is a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. So questions? Or if you don't have questions, you can maybe let us know what motivates you to, to be engaged in some movement in relation to climate change. When, I, when I'm thinking of uh, regulation, I'm specifically thinking of uh, environmental regulations, uh, I think, are definitely needed. And we've moved in the exact opposite direction of that in the last couple of years, where we've been deregulating uh, corporations in terms of, of the impact that they have uh, on the environment. But I would say there are certain aspects of our economy where uh, kind of a free market or, or comp competition uh, is very helpful in terms of driving efficiencies and creating a diversity of products. Um, but even, even in those areas, we still need to have regulations that keep corporations from polluting the planet and exploiting people. So when I talk about regulation, it's mainly regulation to keep the planet from being polluted and keep people from being exploited. But I wouldn't say we have to go, you know, to some totally socialist uh, way of, of thinking about things. But one way of thinking about it is there are certain aspects of our lives where there's uh, a good, a great deal of elasticity of demand, and there are certain aspects of our lives where there's very little elasticity of demand. So in those, in those areas where there's a lot of flexibility, of demand, like you know, what kind of shoe I'm going to wear, or you know, what kind of vehicle I want to drive, or you know, you can have a little bit more uh, uh, free market or capitalistic with, with regulations to make sure that we're not exploiting people or polluting the planet. But in other areas like healthcare and education, where, where, where there's very little elasticity of demand, if you're going to be a flourishing human being, if you're going to have a flourishing human community you need to have accessible, affordable health care, like the rest of the uh, industrialized world has. Uh, if you're going to be a flourishing human community, you need to have greater equality of opportunity when it comes to education, you know, like Finland or uh, the Nordic countries or any number of other countries that have better education systems than we do. So, and, and when you have a, a more educated populace, 
uh, you have a happier populace, you have a populace that will understand environmental problems more uh, effectively, uh, you'll have less corruption, uh, most likely, you'll have a healthier society. Uh, so it, it, it leads to greater flourishing, uh, what you know, Aristotle might call eudaimonia, uh, human flourishing. So <laughs> I think that that there's a place for competition, there's a place for the, the market, there's certainly efficiencies that can come into play when you have that, but in these areas that are really things that we have to have if we're going to flourish as human beings and, and flourish uh, as a larger ecological community, then you, then you have, to, there's a role for government there, there's a role for, there's a role for the community uh, taking action to make sure that there's greater equality of opportunity. I mean, it's environmental justice, environmental racism. So, um, I mean, we know we know that the going back to uh, poverty, uh, one of the triple evils of of King's work in, in the World House. We know that 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 race and economic status are key indicators for uh, what kind of impact. In environmental challenges are going to have on, on people and, and pollution especially. Um, so for example, the, 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 the places in the United States with the greatest amount of toxicity, you know, the greatest amount of, of pollution are typically areas where there's a larger percentage of people of color living there. The impact of, of climate change we know is going to have an impact, a greater impact on countries that can least afford, on regions of the world that can least afford to, to address those challenges. Uh, so when you have that kind of inequity that's built into the political and economic processes, it ends up, uh, you end up having the effects of those persons who are experiencing those inequities also experiencing the inequity of, of, of greater uh, ecological impact, negative ecological impact on their, on their lives. So Houston, for example, one of the places that has one of the worst pollution problems uh, in the world, the, the part of Houston that has just tremendous amount of, of toxic waste is uh, primarily a part of Houston where persons of, of color live. But that happens all over the, all over the United States. Exactly, in what way would you like for me to address it? Well, <laughs> well in terms of climate refugees, in terms of, yeah, I mean, that's, that's going to be one of the, the greatest challenges that we have because, um, especially as you look at sea level rise, the, the number of people who are living uh, in areas that will be affected by the sea level rise that's projected over the next uh, 100 years is in the hundreds and hundreds of millions of, of persons, uh, if not more. So that, and we're already seeing, as, we, as was mentioned a few moments ago, we're already seeing climate refugees um, even, even today. So uh, we know that when you have large movements of people, that's going to exacerbate conflict. That's going to create economic challenges uh, as well. Uh, and already we're seeing conflict be exacerbated by climate change. Syria, for example, you know, one of the things that, that made the conflict in Syria come to a boiling point was Syria was experiencing uh, the worst drought that it experienced in uh, a 500 year period. Uh, so that was one of the contributing factors to that, to that conflict getting to the point uh, that it did. And, and all sorts of think tanks, some very conservative think tanks, look at the 21st century and they see the wars and conflicts 
that we will have in the 21st century as primarily revolving around water uh, and access to water. So, other thoughts or questions or motivations? <laughs> Agriculture also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, big, the biggest thing, well, um, so it's not just about knowledge, right? It's about uh, virtue. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, teaching the knowledge about it and, and the, you know, it's, we can throw the information out there. Yeah, all those things are true that you said, but it's very difficult to, uh, to cultivate virtue. But I, I think it's the money. I mean, the only way that to effectively deal with it is to find a way to overturn the decision that the Supreme Court made with Citizens United. Because when you have unlimited amounts of money going into your political system, the, uh, it's not, it's that money's just not coming from the sky. That's coming from entities and organizations and people who expect something in return uh, for their investment. And so as long as you've got that kind of money in the system, you're going to have these conflicts of interest because normally uh, an elected official would see those conflicts of interest and say, that's a conflict of interest. You, you can't have that. But if, if they're paid not to see that as a conflict of interest, uh, you know, if, they, if, 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 if they're being told by the people that have supported them that you need to support this, they find ways of rationalizing, in a not a very rational way, but rationalizing that, it, that it's not a conflict of interest or it's just the way things are done. This is the way it's always done. So we have to somehow get money out of politics. Um, and, you know, other, other countries have done that a little better than we have. We, We've decided for some strange reason that unlimited amounts of money being poured into the political process equates to free speech. Um, most other countries don't see it that way. Well, I think uh, you may not, the, the answer is kind of complex, I think, but uh, I think the best answer I have is to find ways to cultivate empathy. Because if, if we don't cultivate empathy, if we don't under, really understand other people's concerns and fears and hopes and joys and, and be able to grasp that in some kind of meaningful way and, and feel what other people are feeling, then I don't know if we have the kind of motivation that's necessary to overcome the challenges that we have and the corruption that we have. And I'm, I, you know, I, I say I'm melioristic, but this is one of those areas where I, I sometimes tend towards pessimism because the, everything about the digital age has, has pointed us in the opposite direction of empathy that I think we need to be going. Uh, there was a study done from two, from 1979 to 2009. It was either, I think it was done by Michigan State, where they were they were measuring the empathy of uh, students who are either rising seniors or rising freshmen in college or rising seniors in high school, and their empathy rate declined by over 40 percent over that 30-year period. Each year they do a new set of students. And, it, and the empathy rate declined by over 40% in 30 years. Now, the, the rise of the digital age occurred during that time. You also had uh, massive you know, uh, global events that, that might have led to less empathy. You might have had some economic factors that led to less empathy. But I think the digital age overall and social media and all that entails is not helping us 
in terms of cultivating the kind of empathy that's necessary to address the challenges that we're facing. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be used in positive ways, because it is. I mean, that same social media sometimes is used in very effective ways to organize persons and, and make some positive change. But I, I see that that is one of the, the biggest hurdles that we have. Is how do we get people to disconnect to reconnect? How do we, how do we have real personal uh, interactions in community that make us care enough for each other that we will make the kind of sacrifice we have to make and be motivated to make that sacrifice uh, to, to make the changes we need to make. So I wish I, I wish I were more hopeful about that. I've seen that at the university as well over the 23 year period that I've, I've been there. What, what impact the digital age has had on, on personal relationships and, and community at the university. It's not been a positive one. Yep. Well, um, yeah, we need to. We're at our time, yeah. Yes. Mark, we wanted to say thank you. Okay. And actually, Michelle brought this, and it's a signed copy oh, by Michael oh, Mann. So yes. thank you for coming. By Michael Mann. Yeah. I know him a little bit. That's good. I don't have this book. Good. It's very happy to have it.